Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 172, with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Mother boo-boo. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, well, rest of all, hydrated and all that malarkey. Um, I am back again from a little bit of a hi- hiatus, it feels like. Um, it feels like I haven't really been uploading as often as I was in the past. I did one podcast last week, so I didn't miss out on a week. I did, I think, uh, maybe two or three the week before. But from now, I'm going to come back onto my regular scheduled programming. And if you're wondering why I've been away, like, why, I guess, you know, what the hell has happened? Um, life happened, really, didn't it? Um, I let I let the kind of outside... Um, circumstances i let some kind of i let a little bit of internal turmoil kind of take over my week which then led to me not being able to do the things i like to do which is record the podcast which is do some reading which is work out so some things have like kind of fallen by the wayside and i think um over the last week or so over the last couple of weeks I kind of um, looked myself in the mirror and been really critical about what I've been doing and um, and tried to really kind of analyze where I was falling short, why I was falling short and just trying to address those issues so that it doesn't happen again because I had this um, little, I wouldn't even call it a breakdown. I had a little bit of a, of a sad moment a couple of weeks ago where, you know, just reflecting on the things I've done um, thus far. And I guess, you know, as as is as per human nature, I kind of had I, I I had forgotten about all the work I had done that brought me to this point. I forgot about all the kind of, you know, all the things that I'd kind of been able to overcome, the things I'd been able to kind of endure. Um, I forgot them all and then I kind of was just in a bit of a funk about the situation I was in currently. I was wondering how, you know, just just I was I was a little bit I was, I was feeling a little bit impatient. All right? I was feeling a little bit impatient with how long it was taking me to kind of you know achieve my dreams and to get to a place where I wanted to get to. And I kind of had a bit of a breakdown based on that, right? Just thinking, fuck, man, like how long is this gonna take? Right? How long do I have to wait until I can kind of you know carve out a little lane for myself in order to kind of uh, allow myself to let my lifestyle become my business and then allow that then to become self sufficient and then so I can kind of you know break out of the scourge of being constantly employed at these um jobs i don't really give a shit about um but then of course you know when you're in that kind of situation it's always a little bit um you know you t- you tend to kind of externalize your problems like oh is that it's him it's her it's this whatever but by and large you know go- going by the addict of extreme ownership which is at the back there which you can see over there extreme ownership going by the extreme ownership addict from joko wilnick it really is my own problem right it's a problem that only i can address and it's a problem that's only affecting me but obviously when i solve this it's going to be an issue that's going to uh, affect positively the lives of a lot of people around me but it's an issue that i have to overcome and by and large it's a problem that i've kind of made for myself right because i'm only thinking like that because i'm impatient i'm only thinking like that because maybe i had someone in my mind that i was comparing myself to i'm only thinking like that because i don't know because um I thought my shit doesn't stink and I was patting myself on the back for the work I was doing. But really and truly, as I've kind of mentioned previously on here and other people have mentioned too when it comes to pursuing your passions, this, this is something I'll be doing even if I wasn't getting paid, right? This is something I'll be doing even if it wasn't bringing me any kind of monetary value or any kind of career opportunities. I'll be doing it anyway because it's something I enjoy to do. So if that be the, if that is the case, then why am I getting myself into a funk? Why am I bothered, right? I should just be doing it anyway and just enjoying it. Um, The fact that I kind of had a bit of a, I kind of had some disparaging um, thoughts or ideas when it came to the place I was working at or just jobs in general. That again, that came from the idea that I was kind of, you know, poo-pooing having been employed and working somewhere when there's honor in working a job. There's honor in being able to go somewhere, work for six to eight hours, um, do your best work and then go home. There's a lot of pride in that, right? Being able to take the bread um, that you're making from this from your job and be able to invest in yourself right uh being part of a team um being an integral member of the team people thinking that they can rely on you all this sort of stuff like these are all traits and characteristics that are going to help me going forward in the stuff that i'm doing in my own life right so it's all kind of it's all beneficial they all kind of add to the holistic approach i think i've mentioned it a few times um some of the most productive times i've had have been when I've been employed, right? When I've had like a nine to five because I've had to then do all the stuff I'm doing now outside of my working hours. So it takes a lot of discipline, right? It takes a lot of um, hard work. It takes a lot of sacrifice to kind of make these things work, right? Today I woke up at what, 6.30 in the morning, went for a run, came back, washed, showered, and now here I am presenting a podcast, record this, upload, and then go to work. 
then they want to come back or I'll, I'll continue making flyers i'll be writing on my blog do you know what i mean there's things that you can still have to do but that only happens because i have so much limited time in the day um so that was kind of where i was at but then you know again i had a bit of a an honest look at myself honest conversation and i kind of thought to myself you know what these good things that have been happening to me lately have only come as a consequence of the work i've been doing and they've only really come as a consequence of me pushing maybe 60 percent of the way right i haven't really been going all the way in particularly um there are things that i'm still doing that are probably holding me back in terms of really going for it and really kind of being able to achieve what i want to achieve and I have to be honest with that. I can't just think because I've got because I'm pushing sixty percent of the way and I'm getting some results back that that's good enough. It has to be more than that because I don't also want to enter the space of being self sufficient or having my own thing. I don't want to enter that space operating at sixty percent. I want to enter that space operating at hundred, right? So then I'll blitz everyone out of the room or off the field that's already working there because they've already got comfortable, they've already had their career, and I can come in with fresh idea, fresh energy, um, determination, hard work, um, work ethic, whatever it may be, and just completely blitz that room and then carve a little space myself that's mine and mine alone. Um, but yeah, that's what happened the last couple of weeks, hence the lack of uploads and stuff, but kind of back on it now, like I said, and again, I think in life, it's best to be brutally honest with yourself. Like, you know, the same way when, you know, when... um. You know, someone asks you to go somewhere like, hey, you know, do you want to come to this thing? You instantly know the answer, don't you? More likely than not, you always know what the real answer is. You know what the answer is. You don't even need to think about it. It's not really a thing to think about. Um, you want to go out? Yes or no. You want to go here? Yes or no. You want this thing? Yes or no. You generally know what, you generally know what the question is, but sometimes because we're shy or because we don't want to um, hurt our friend's feelings, we'll be like, oh, let me get back to you. Let me think about it, whatever it may be. But you know what the answer is. In the, it's the same thing when you're being honest with yourself. You look yourself in the mirror and you're like, am I really doing enough? Should I really be this upset with other people? Should I really be comparing myself? Should I really be pissed off with where I am in life? And then the answer is usually no. If you're honest with yourself, if you're a flipping sociopath, then maybe you think your shit that truly doesn't stink, right? But for the most part, the average folk is like, you know what? Yeah, I'm right. I'm not doing enough. I need to do more. You could just kind of say it to yourself quietly and just continue working. And um, I think that's something I've been um, able to do quite well. And I'm just lucky. I think I'm just, again, it's not something I'd, I'd say it's a skill. I'm not I'm not taking any credit for it. I just think I'm lucky the way I've made up. Um, I'm just not wired in a way where I kind of try to blame other people. I'm not wired in a way where I don't take responsibility for my actions. I don't take responsibility for the things that have, have happened in my life which have been negative or have been whatever I, don't, I, I always take responsibility for it and try to fix it right um i don't kid myself and that's something i've been really fortunate to have because you know i think that's one thing that it'd be hard to teach someone to do right not to kid themselves not to give not to be under any sort of false illusions or false impressions i think um that's something i've been really good at doing whether it's at work whether it's outside of work i kind of i'm quite honest with how i am and what i'm doing and how i can become a better person hopefully and that's basically where i am at situation now so yeah that's a kind of quick update on where i've been um apart from that to what i've been up to um apart from that what's that? you know i know apart from that let's just get straight into it man um it's been a tough weekend man it's been a tough weekend for the hip-hop community um i think as i'm sure a lot of you are aware um the great the influential the inspiring, the motivational um, rapper, entrepreneur, philanthropist, um, call him whatever you want to call him, a real estate mogul, um, just a real icon, um, a real pioneer, um, uh, a living legend, a young legend. You know, people say a lot of you know, the young legend thing, like a real young OG um, in the shape of Nipsey Hussle, unfortunately was murdered um, on, I think it was Sunday, right? I think it was Sunday, but I saw the news on April 1st on a Monday morning, which isn't the best time to see it, right? Because it's um, April Fool's. And um, I found out about it because, you know, usually um, I don't usually check my phone in the morning. I try to kind of wake up and have like 30 minutes just like, you know, being phoneless and kind of just kind of, you know, recalibrating myself and getting myself centered and then by the time i get ready i'm going out for a runway for maybe but on this rare occasion for some reason i picked up my phone and went straight to bbc news um and i saw nipsey's face right but it was it was cut out it was cut right through the middle i didn't see the bottom of the i didn't see the bottom where the headline was and straight away i knew it was something bad um i think for the bbc you know it's a website it's a new site i we use a lot here in the uk and um 
for Nipsey to be on there, I knew it wouldn't be anything good because for the most part, they only concentrate on like the, you know, the commercial big hit rappers like Jay-Z, Drake, Kendrick, J. Cole, da 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 so if they have the, if they have those said artists on their website, it might be something to do with a tour. It might be something to do with a really thought provoking interview they did. But it was it's unlikely that J Cole would make that, especially when the picture was of him at the Grammys. If it was something to do with the work he did in the community, you would see that picture, right? You'd see him surrounded by folk, whatever. But it was just a picture of him at the Grammys, and I was like, "Fuck!" I scrolled down, and it's like, "Yeah, Nipsey Hussle has been murdered," and it was like. It didn't make sense, man. It just didn't make sense. It just didn't make sense. Like, there's rappers probably in this industry or in this scene now, if you heard they got shot and killed, it wouldn't surprise you. And that isn't to say you don't care about their life, but, you know, the image they portray, how they carry themselves, it wouldn't surprise you that, you know, the life they lead, that someone wants them dead, right? But Nipsey Hussle was such a good dude. He was doing so much good work in the community. He'd come from that world, but obviously he kind of made amends to kind of, you know, uh, correct himself and not be that person anymore, right? And then bring this camera forward. Um, he'd kind of done all the work needed in order to kind of, you know, um, re-atone for any kind of karma, any kind of negative karma that might have come his way in terms of the, the stuff that he was doing in, the, in, um, in his hood that might have been bad from the community and stuff. He'd done... He kind of made amends. Um, he did the unthinkable and got his masters back. Um, he was able to put out an album for free and then still have people buy it for a hundred dollars or a mixtape. That garnered a lot of kind of attention in terms of how ingenious that marketing idea was and the idea that you were supporting him and his vision. He was able to take those funds and direct and put them right back into his community, right? Buying back his block that he was hanging out with with his friends when they were younger. He was in the process of setting up a co-working space, setting up process of setting up a school for young kids to learn STEM. STEM subjects in order to kind of make them, um, comp- uh, in order to make them able to compete with applicants at Silicon Valley. And he was just generally a good dude, right? He got together with Lauren London who already had a kid with somebody else and, they fell in love after she had, you know, many failed relationships. And she probably was, you know, thinking there's probably no good guys left out there, right? And then she finally finds Nipsey, who's like, you know, the man of her dreams. And yeah, man, it just it just really got it just really caught me off guard, man. It really, really caught me off guard. Like, especially since um, the last couple of weeks I've been on a bit of a Nipsey binge. I've been watching I've watched loads of his old interviews. This is prior to him passing away. Um, I just watched loads of his interviews and the last interview I watched was the interview where Nipsey and Lauren London had a little sit down with GQ uh, as part of the cover story that they did the amazing editorial I'm sure that you've seen it the picture of Nipsey um, uh, with Lauren London on a white horse and Nipsey holding it and then walking through um, the streets of LA and watching that video you could just see how in love Lauren was with Nipsey man like she adored that guy like adored him like you don't see that too often. And then they're, they're a young couple, right? And you can see that he adored her too. And it kind of went through a little bit of a breakup. They got back together again. They had a kid. And it was just, they, they were just, um, yeah, it was just, I think immediately when I heard the news of Nipsey Hussle passing or being murdered, that's what happened to me. Like, I got sad, not because of, I got sad because of Nipsey, because I'm a big fan, right? I've, I, 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 Victory Lab last year was one of the, my favorite albums. I was a little bit annoyed that he released it so early in the year. I think it came out in January or something. So it kind of had got forgotten by the middle of the year because so much music had come out. I kind of hoped he kind of released it earlier, but I'm assuming, you know, there was, my, there was a reason why he put it out in January. He wanted to have like legs to kind of last all the way through December. But for me, it was like one of my favorite albums of the year. Um, had some amazing visuals, um, videos that people are playing now. And um, just in general, his sound was you know, something that you can't really... You know, some as his sound was something that couldn't be copied too easily. Couldn't be into, uh, um, uh, <sighs> yeah, just couldn't be copied. And um, yeah, immediately when I found out that he passed, my first thought, my first thought or first feeling was just to the people that surrounded him. That's what really broke my heart, like because he was so selfless, right? He gave so much of himself to everyone around him. He tried to lift up everyone around him. He tried to, you know. Try to use the influence, the celebrity, the fame, the money, 
the attention that he had in order to kind of highlight other people around him in his community give other people opportunities and that's immediately the first thing that I thought of I was like fuck what what now you know and there's a lot to it there's a lot to the story um, that I'm sure is on social and I'm sure mostly because I've seen it um, now the news has come out that the dude that supposedly murdered Nipsey Hussle has been arrested um there's news now that supposedly some of his family members have been have been killed as well because of this as a retaliation, which again is incredibly tragic because they had nothing to do with the situation. And it's just again, it's just that's what broke my heart. That's what I think made me cry. And then like an idiot, um, I decided to watch a video of Nipsey Hussle being taken away on a stretcher in the hospital. I mean to the hospital, right? Um, which way he was pronounced dead and and I just cried, man. I just cried my eyes out, man. Like, it just didn't make any sense. Like, it just doesn't make any sense now. It really doesn't make any sense. Just can't wrap my head around why someone would want to take out somebody who was trying to do so much good. And it wasn't like he was somebody that had one foot in and one foot out, right? He was trying to do everything he could in his power to show that, you know, there was another option. He wasn't, he, he and he wasn't one of those people that was, out there disparaging gang culture right because you know there are there are there are very far entrenched reasons why gang culture still persists right now right reasons that are way 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 above anyone's pay grade um but he was just trying to offer those kids another option you can gang bang if you want but this is another option to get out of the hood because in those kind of areas they feel as if they have no other option especially once you get chucked out of school so um he tried to provide them with that option and you know it's just like why would someone want to do that? It just doesn't make any sense. And it's just a fatality. It's just a kind of the the brutality, the evilness of it, just to take him out completely, right? The story goes that supposedly this guy was trying to get a picture or trying to hang out around the shop. And supposedly he snitched back in the day, so they didn't want to hang him hanging around the shop anymore because, you know, if you snitch, don't hang around us anymore. Which is a perfectly okay frame of mind to operate under, right? You snitch to get out of prison. You live in this gang life and you decided to snitch and on your friends and tell and, you know, put them away for longer because you you were scared of staying in prison for too long. Cool, no worries. Not everyone's built for that life. They allow you to come back to your hood. You don't, you don't actually get run out of the hood. You, you're allowed to stay, right? But you just can't hang around us. That's all they say. Just don't hang around us. You can stay... People might call your names in shops. You might get fr- people might for exit you, but for the most part, you can live in amongst your community. You can live. You can live in amongst it, but just can't hang around us. I don't think that's a bad thing. But supposedly he felt embarrassed. He felt like his manhood got taken away from him. Instead of offering to fight, right? Yeah, uh, whatever. Instead of having an argument, he decides to get a gun and completely take Nipsey off the planet. And it's like, why? Like, was that worth it? Was that worth it? It honestly wasn't. But again, it's just, you're talking about a different kind of person, a person that doesn't have the kind of regard for life that I guess that me and you do. And um, I don't know, man. For me, it just made me lose hope. I think for the most part, if I'm really honest, it just made me lose hope. Because I look at the situation with Nipsey Hussle, I think to myself, if you're trying to do good, right? If you're trying to do good, if you're trying to really help your community and you're trying to get people out, you're trying to provide them another option, you're trying to show them what it, um, another way, you're trying to, you know, especially people that are, have, have not been shown another way all their life, this is the thanks you get. You get killed. And I just don't know whether or not it's worth it. I just don't think it's worth it. Like, what's the point? And now it explains a lot why people don't do this, right? Explain because, you know, there is a thinking in the hip hop community that people should be going back to their community their community that they come from and trying to give back right there is this idea that some people look at some other people begrudgingly they look at them they look down upon them they look down upon some people who go who kind of you know get the riches and fame of the of whatever artistry they're doing and they kind of move away to calabasas move away to kind of some nice estate somewhere behind big um, gates uh, with security guards in front and they think oh you know you've changed you moved up on us you, you sold out whatever it may be and now there is kind of an idea in my head of like yeah i get it man 
you probably can't help the same way from a distance. You probably won't have the same desire to help from a distance. Your community probably won't, won't, won't want your help that much from a distance. But at least you get to stay alive. At least your family still has you. Your friends still have you. Your supporters still because it's your music. But I guess the other side of me thinks there wouldn't be this outpouring of love and support. There wouldn't be this sense of loss like that I feel not knowing this guy one minute. I've never met him in my life. I've just seen him only on the internet. There wouldn't be this sense of loss if he didn't do the work he did. The work that he did is what makes us feel like, oh my God, who would do this to this guy? That's what makes us feel that way because we know how much he, we know how important he was to us from the from the outside looking in. Imagine how much important. Imagine how important he was to the people living in amongst his community. But I don't know, man. It's just the damage that this is gonna do is just um. It hasn't been. We we can't even predict it. We can't even understand how much damage is gonna do from the way it's gonna demotivate people to go and give back to their com- local community they've grown up in from the retaliation from the back and forth between gangs about you know in order to kind of make sure they make amends for his death which isn't going to bring him back from the amount of broken souls family and friends who have kind of you know had him as their anchor as the glue that holds their family together from his wife and children from the people that work in his stores what happens to them for the people that were, were going to do business with him what happens to those deals like there's so many things that are gonna just like fall by the wayside because somebody decided to end an argument this way and it's just like wow wow i don't know man i don't know i'm just i'm just shocked man. i'm shocked and appalled and I just think there needs to be a change. I just don't know if there will be because I just don't know if that kind of mentality of person will ever change. That kind of person who gets annoyed that somebody's doing good, right? That kind of person that gets pissed off, that gets angry when they see somebody succeeding or going for their dreams. That person that's cynical, that's full of bitterness. It's just that murderer who killed Nipsey is just one step above that. That's that kind of same thinking that comes from there, right? The idea that you get angry with somebody who has who's more has more success than you, right? Looking at it through the murderer's eyes, like seeing Nipsey surrounded by people that he loves, that, that love him, seeing the glow that engulfs around Nipsey, seeing the way people talk to him with reverence, right? Because I've heard online that Nipsey was a big deal in his area. Like he walked around like royalty, like like he, he, he had a presence about him, right? Um seeing that and you being that way inclined it would rub you up the wrong way right it would really annoy or really wrangle you to the point where you just want to be you'd be violent to the extent where you just have a red missile would descend upon your eyes and i just don't know whether that person can ever change i don't know i don't know if there's any amount of education we could give them that would make them not do that i just don't think it's possible i just don't think i just think some people are wired a different way and i guess oh if i'm being optimistic i'd say to the kid up out there who looks at this and is like uh, demoralized about wanting to give back to the community, I'd say don't because you know the world needs you. Uh, however short Nipsey's life must might have been on Earth, I think his influence will live on long before we're gone. Right? Um, I would say don't be dis- discouraged, but there is also a part of me that's maybe thinking there has to be a way of doing this without putting yourself at harm's way, all right? Without, because you just can't control what other people are going to do. You know what you're going to do. You know how you carry yourself, right? He he made, it, he made it a point not to carry a weapon because, you know, he had numerous felonies and he didn't want to um, get himself in trouble again with the police and get locked up and be away from his children. So he employed a security guard who sadly took the day off that day because Nipsey gave him the day off. Supposedly, I read online that the security guard that was meant to be with Nipsey or the bodyguard that was everywhere with him was going through his own personal issues and Nipsey told him to take some time off on a Sunday to hang out with his family and then they'll see him again on Monday. And the day off, the, the, the day he decides to take his day off and then look what happens. And now, you know, the bodyguard wrote a long, really heartfelt um, Instagram post the other day talking about how he's heartbroken and he blames himself. He said that he'd swap, his, he'd swap positions with Nipsey in a heartbeat. He'd take his own life if, if to have Nipsey back here again. And that he's going to retire from bodyguarding um, 
forever and it's like now this guy's blaming himself for the death and it's just it's just heartbreaking man it's just heartbreaking you know I really don't know what to say, man. I really, really don't know what to say. Really heartbreaking. And again, I'm a big fan. I'm a huge fan. It's just it's so um such a bad it's such a sad coincidence because I was honestly I was on a two week binge of watching every single Nipsey Hussle interview there was because I was so in, I was just like it just inspired me watching his interviews talking about how he got his masters back and the way he's trying to give back to the community or the projects he's doing. It just really inspired me. So then to to have that two week period. Um, uh, bookended by this is just it's just yeah it's just I don't know I don't know what to say man I really really don't know what to say I guess thoughts and thoughts and feelings go out to everyone that surrounds him uh, family and friends of Nipsey um, I don't know man I really don't know how um, how they're going to recover from this or what the process is to recover I'm assuming the community will gather around and help to prop them up but this probably isn't the time to speak about those kind of things now i just want to remember nipsey and say r.i.p to the great man um nipsey uh hustle in the house um big inspiration to me really gave me um really motivated me to kind of to to really go for my dreams um really motivated me to have ownership on the things that i do really motivated me to be a a good family member to be a good partner, to be a good brother, to be a good son, um, and just to be a good guy, right? Because he just came across like a good guy. Um, yeah, man. R.I.P. Nipsey Hussle. You'll be sorely, sorely missed, man. <sighs> um, yeah. Uh, moving on from that, there's no real good segue to go from there, really. But um. You really hope things need to change, innit? Things really need to change. I guess they really do need to change, you know? There's people speak a lot about, you know, the patriarchy and, you know, white supremacy and institutional racism and shit, but... Okay, you go to a company and they don't hire you because your name is Olatunde, right? No problem. You get pulled over 60 million times because the police think you stole the car. No problem. But the likelihood that you'll get slain, you'd get murdered, right? You get taken off this planet by those in charge, right? By those people in these higher positions is probably it's quite rare, right? Even these police brutality incidents that happen on we see on Wall Street and stuff, right? They they are the they are the exception to the rule, right? Most most often people get harassed by cops, I'm sure, right? Latino and black people get harassed by cops, right? Um, much more so than they, their white their white counterparts. But the but you know the fact that it doesn't all end in fatalities. It kind of you know, it's a it's a rare case. But to each other, right? Uh, black on black, we love to just I don't know. There is um, we disregard each other, maybe even worse than the the people that we think are out to murder us. We don't really value each other's lives that much. We don't at all. We want to go to the nth degree, and it's like, wow. That's the bit that really needs to be fixed in our community or as a race. Again, maybe collective collectivity, um, collective identity isn't the name of the game now. That's not something that's going to resolve things. We need to take we have we have to take individual responsibility. But it needs to be a you know, an awakening amongst us to realize that this isn't how we go go about things. Because I wonder what other people must think, right? It's just, it just doesn't make any sense, man. It's like, if Taylor Swift or Miley Cyrus said something really stupid, right? You wouldn't go and murder them, would you? You wouldn't just go and kill them because you didn't agree with what they said or because they embarrassed you. Like, you wouldn't do that. You'd maybe argue. You'd maybe not buy their albums anymore. you maybe call their names in the interview, but you wouldn't murder them, right? You That's like... It, we we're losing some of our greats because other people just murder them. It's just it's nuts. It's fucking nuts. It really is nuts. And then the bad characters, the people that we shouldn't have in our community, the ones that are um, steal, the ones that are robbing people blind, right? The ones that are selling people dreams. 
they live on into their fucking old, old, old age, isn't it? It's just, it's bizarre. Really, truly is bizarre. Anyway, um, moving on. <clears throat> on Saturday, I went to go see um, Nina Kravitz play at um, the Wolverstone Assembly Hall as part of a night called Retextured, um, which was hosted by Crank Brother, which was really, really really awesome um uh i went to it because of um what was i going to it let me get the review up here i went to it because um i listened to an interview with the crank brother guys at um on, on resident advisor and it was a great interview like super super amazing interview um where the crank brother dudes kind of spoke about their come up and about how they used to promote parties and about the next chapter and it's a really you know eye-opening interview in terms of like what they had been doing in their career um going forward and it really kind of inspired me obviously with the things that i'm doing now in terms of djing and kind of you know we you call it club yeah i've got club promoting and the stuff that i'm kind of doing at the moment it really kind of inspired me and i kind of was like oh wow this was cool and then they spoke about the festivals that they're doing and they're doing this festival called Retextures and a few others. And I saw it, I was like, oh, wow, Nina Kravitz playing in Wolverstone. That's such a weird and rare occasion, right? Nina Kravitz is one of the DJs that I'm kind of a real big fan of. I just love the way she plays. Um, she kind of had a bit of, you know, a little bit of controversy early, not early on, but, you know, in the middle part of her career due to the whole um, Resident Advisor um, interview piece that she done where she was, you know, in the bath with bubbles and shit. And I think a few DJs such as Maceo Plex and stuff kind of, you know, felt a bit untowards about it um, because she was kind of the one that was kind of being propped up as the next big star. And a lot of the people in the scene kind of felt it was, you know, her kind of sexually exploiting herself in order to kind of gain new ground and to kind of, you know, get further ahead. Which, you know, to some point might be true, but by and large, she is a very good DJ. Anyway, skill. Weird when it comes to just the skill of DJing, she's one of the best out there. So um, I saw that listed up there. I was like, oh my God, it's in Wolverstone. It's not too far from where I live. Um, and I decided to buy a ticket and go. And of course, buying a ticket on Resident Advisor is super easy, pretty simple process. I think it cost me like 25 quid, um, which again, a lot more expensive, a lot uh, uh, more expensive than it would be to go to Bergheim or Panorama Bar. But, you know, we don't live in Berlin. The cost of living here is much, much more expensive than it was in Berlin, so you can't complain about that. Uh, bought a ticket on Resident Advisor, added the ticket to my wallet with a QR code, and then kind of spent most of the Friday lis listening to um, other bits of techno, not her techno, other bits of techno, um, um, DJing a bit, just kind of getting me in the mood, and I got a bus, um, a, tw a 69, all the way up there, 50, 40, 30 minutes, um, and then I arrived, and I had a midwall store assembly before, and it's just like an amazing... Um, building caught with an amazing courtyard on the front and it was just weird to kind of walk up to this place that looked like i don't know uh, it looked like a theater and to see loads of people dressed in black you know obvious kind of like you know um techno fans and electronic music fans heading to this weird kind of theater place and at the front as you'd come in it had kind of all the barriers set up and massive kind of pillars and people with um uh, card readers and scanning so they can scan you in with your ticket you walk in, you get patted down. The search was a bit aggressive, don't get me wrong. Um, um, if there's one thing I could say about the night, I'd say there was probably, the, the security was heavy-handed as fuck. There was security everywhere, like everywhere. It was like, like, again, maybe it's because I haven't been to one of these things in a long time, like um, these sort of nights in, in a bigger space. Because I think, if I, what's the last one I went to? Yeah, I went to see... Dr. Rubenstein and Roy Pires at Mixed Garage, right, which is a smaller venue and they kind of run it in a smaller way too, right, they run it in a kind of like a, in a club night way um, I'm not sure what the capacity is there actually it's quite a big venue, might be 500 capacity maybe 500, but it's a smaller space right, it feels a bit smaller, they run it like a little club night, it's in Hackney Wick, right so they usually have, you know, a couple of security guards outside you know, to kind of, you know, um, make sure the line goes smoothly and then they have maybe a couple inside roaming around. And that's basically it, right? And then maybe one station outside in the smoking area. But this one, I, re I, this, I rechecked it. They had the security guards outside. It's had security guards inside patting you down. They had another security guard at the door. They had security guards um, on the sides of the re of the room. They had somebody like uh, um, a kind of cleaning person going around picking up cups out on the floor with a bag. Like just going around constantly picking up bags. Uh, cups right um, which I didn't think was needed right they could have just easily just you know did it at the end and kind of sweet them all up but I guess maybe um, they knew they, they, they probably knew better than I do uh, they probably know better than I do why they did why they did that 
and then they had police. I mean, sorry, security guard police coming up and down the stairs, going outside the smoking room. There's police. There's security guard, sorry, coming in and out the the bathrooms every four minutes. It just felt a little bit heavy handed, right? It just got. It just kind of put you out of the vibe. And again, I think with electronic music, especially with stuff like that, you want it to be immersive. You want to forget about your surroundings, but you constantly get reminded of surroundings when some guy in a fluorescent jacket or some big dude with like a massive yellow badge on the side of it thing is coming around, right? It just makes it just kind of puts you out of the mood. And again, can't complain. I guess this is the, this is the kind of landscape that we're in. We're in London. I'm not going to keep fetishizing in uh, Berlin when I don't live there. But, you know, that experience of being in Berlin and having that kind of freedom and being able to kind of, and even other club nights I've been to, in London, where you don't really feel like you're being watched all the time, it kind of feels a bit, you know, you kind of lose yourself in a dance a bit more. But again, I didn't think too much of it. Kind of put myself down. I was like, now I'm going to concentrate. I'm going to have a good time. Went to the bar, got myself a whiskey and a drink, and then decided just to kind of go and pick a spot somewhere where I could just dance and have a good time and fucking freak out because you know I paid twenty five quid for this thing. I got that at twelve. I went to see it. Went to dance all the way into a through in the night until for for a whole set. So I just picked a corner towards the side of the room, maybe towards the left, uh, her left, right? Um, and the setup was amazing. Just like a big black box that she was DJing on. You couldn't even see the the, the decks. And there was a, ma- a massive kind of um, edge-to-edge projection on the back of her, uh, behind her. Uh, lighting towards the side of it. And the projection was basically, the lighting was kind of cut out. You couldn't, the lighting wasn't on her. You couldn't see her exactly. You just saw a silhouette of her on be- uh, um uh in front of the screen so that when she was dancing and moving you just saw her hands flailing around in the kind of nina kravitz way so it's fu- it, it looks fucking awesome i think i might have a picture of it here and it's kind of fred here see if they got it no the wall. this is basically her dancing but you couldn't really see so that's basically her dancing in a, in a Warsaw assembly and it just scores of people just shocking out. and again i think security is so secure heavy-handed security aside i think the one thing that was amazing was that the bar was you know awesome the bartenders were great they had two bars on e- either side at the end of the room and they were they were just serving drinks super quickly they weren't, weren't hanging around i think that was awesome the bartenders were great so shout out to the bartenders they hooked it up um one thing that was fucking cool was the people that were there that was a fucking good crowd man they were really up for it they were dancing all night long like no one stopped dancing everyone was just fucking shocking out throwing shapes having a good time i loved it i loved it loved it loved it i love seeing so many people dance like that that was a really um good experience to see and really something that really kind of brought me a lot of joy in that respect so i like seeing people dance have a good time so that was awesome um and yeah i had an amazing time man you know again i think i mentioned somebody else i went to a bar the next day I think, like seeing Dr. Roy Perez and Dr. Rubenstein, and like um, the same way when I went to go, um, when I went to uh, Bergheim, I saw DJ Harvey play in the main room or in Bergheim. Um, like when I went to go see see drum on somewhere like so Wire. It's really important, I think, for a DJ or somebody that's into electronic music to go out and see these people live, especially the top tier, especially the A, the A, the 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 A class, right? The 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 top of the top of the DJs out there. I think it's really important to go out and see them. I think sometimes you can get a little bit, um, we're a bit spoiled in the fact that we get to see a lot of the DJs play on the internet, whether it's through your boiler room, uh, whether it's via any other fucking streaming website that puts them online, right? Whether it's through SoundCloud mixes, we get to, we get to see and hear a lot of them online. So we don't really feel like we should be going to go see them play live. But I think you should. Because there's something about seeing these people play live, DJing especially, especially because I'm a DJ and I think I'm good, right? Seeing somebody like the Kanina Kravitz um, start and end the DJ set, right? Four hours of techno just kind of like taking you up, down, up, down, up, down. And I think I mentioned somebody um, the other day that whenever I felt like I was getting tired, it, it seemed like she was also... Look, Lenny Kravitz was also t- kind of taking it down a notch, and then when I started to feel a little bit like I could go again, all of a sudden the music was was cranking up one more time. It wasn't a coincidence. It didn't feel like it was a coincidence to me. It felt like she knew what she was doing. That she was reading a crowd without reading a crowd, right? And there's a really good Jeff Mills interview that's out now, Resident <coughs> Advisor, <coughs> where he says something along the lines of like, you know, he's been doing it so long, he doesn't even look at a crowd anymore because you can't usually when he's on stage, you can't even see anybody because it's so dark, right? Um, but he can, you can kind of feel it in your bones, right? Where people are want wanting to go, and I guess with her, there's the same thing too. With Nina Kravitz, like she can just feel it, I guess, for the most part, 
or maybe because she's a dancer she can actually look at people and see what they're doing but that was just incredible to see and to hear to witness just how effortlessly she was just taking us left right up down across it was just it was honestly it was like awe inspiring how good she was and it just really motivated me and got me to DJing again like so much so when I came back home I just I did like a quick mix I was so inspired it was just it was fucking awesome like honestly seeing somebody of her stature play live it's like wow I get it I get it I was happy again I saw her in a kind of you know an enclosed environment because you know there was a I'm got, I forgot where I'm gonna is it it might not be Junction 2 but something else I wanted to go to which again is another Crank Brother promotion Crank Brother smashed it by the way you, those guys big up to them too I went to a few of their Shoreditch Street, part, Shoreditch Street parties back in the day and um who would have thought they've kind of come look how far they've come from promoting in clubs to doing what they're doing now it's just a really really amazing thing and they you know they run a very lean operation i think this is something long as they've only got three full-time staff so it's two brothers and one other person everyone else kind of freelances and helps them out where it need be so yeah like i said like just really cool dudes who are really doing it the right way um but again like it's just just all inspiring absolutely all inspiring i recommend you check out there's probably videos online of, of her performing and stuff which are actually let me try to see if i can find them uh but again a really cool environment really play, cool place to go to um it ended exactly on at four she kind of wound it down with an amazing you know, classic nina kravitz kind of um ending tune really kind of took it down and not slowed it down and then it was just like rapturous applause when she finished like people clapping and hooting and hollering um really amazing atmosphere to see her play like um again that's the kind of promotion that you want when you book a nina kravitz you don't want to see her play for i don't know two hours in the nightclub somewhere you want to, you want something a promoter to really risk it all and again i'm not sure how much money they made on it if any but you want a, prom a promoter to really risk it all and kind of um uh put them in a space where they can kind of really work and really make the best of themselves. And I think that's basically what we got there. Let me see if I can find a video of it on YouTube. Maybe someone uploaded it. Uh, another kind of thing that I was a, lot, a little bit annoyed by, the people that were up, the amount of people that are recording um, was a little bit annoying. That was a little bit annoying. It's like, you're watching Nina Kravitz in Wolverhampton, man. Put your phone down and enjoy it. That was a, That was a thing that kind of pissed me off a little bit. Um, there were so many cameras out. I think it got it got better towards the end. People stopped kind of putting their phones out and stuff. But I think for the most part, people were recording because they wanted to steal her songs. I think for the most part, people are doing song ID checks. I think so because I know that's what I used to do when I first got into techno. <clears throat> One of the things I used to do religiously was, you know, um, every weekend I'd kind of search Ricardo Villa Lobos. I go on YouTube, I search upload date, and I just kind of look for um, videos that people have had uploaded of Ricardo Villa Lobos playing out somewhere. And that's kind of what I used to do religiously all the fucking time. And you'd get loads of gems that way, right? Someone would upload a video of like, Ricardo Villa Lobos playing in some far flung place somewhere. He played this amazing house track that you could go and then play for your friends and pretend that like you found it. <laughs> um, so I guess I used to do it too, but. It was just annoying to see how many people had their phones out. I was like, come on, dudes, like, put your phone down. But again, you know, I guess it's not my business to tell anyone what to do with their phones and stuff. But that was the only slight thing that kind of rubbed me up the wrong way. Um, but like I said, by and large, an incredible, incredible, incredible night. Let me see if I can find it on here. Maybe someone looking on Instagram. I just want to see if someone's got a video of it. Just to kind of see what it looked and remind me. But again, like I said, I'm, I'm easy to go back home from again. Um, another even shorter bus journey home because there wasn't any traffic um got the bus back and then kind of you know chilled out for the most part but yes yeah, seeing in the Kravitz play live was just fucking incredible um a really a real real pleasure and a real treat um for those of us that live in this part of east london that aren't necessarily um you know uh don't necessarily get the club nights that we should be getting in, in and around here um but again a really really good evening let me see if i can find a video of it so i must have a video of her Oh, you know what? Actually, it was cool. Nina Kravitz's crew. Uh, because I didn't see them because I was obviously standing towards the back dancing, having a good time. But when I went to the smoke in there and I came back in, um, some of her crew were standing to the side of the of the stage. They looked fucking cool, man. Like, they looked awesome. They looked fucking awesome. Like, think of what Nina Kravitz's crew looked like. Loads of, like, kind of... I uh, wouldn't... Would you call it cyber goths? I don't know. But people just dressed amazing. Like, kind of people that would hang around with Demna at Balenciaga and Vetamon kind of crew. You know what I mean? Those kind of people. They really kind of... They looked amazing. Uh, so, yeah. So, 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 big up Nina Kravitz's crew. They looked fucking cool. Let me see if I can find a video of it. Someone must have a video of it. No, nothing, 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 nothing. Oh. So all these videos that were being taken in the club, right, and no one's uploading a video of Nina Kravitz playing a Wolverstone Assembly. 
That is very, very peculiar. Or maybe I'm missing something here. Yeah, no videos. No one's got any videos. Like, even on Instagram, I've just typed in... Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no one's got anything. Okay, that's really strange. Considering the amount of phones that are out there. I didn't. I, I took a couple pictures of my film camera, but I didn't take my phone out once. Uh, let me see if I can find something via Crank Brothers. Let's see if they got anything on there. Uh, but again, like I said, they fucking smashed it, Crank Brothers. They did a really good job, and I'm really happy for them and all their successes, man. Um, I really recommend you check them out. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, okay, cool. Doesn't doesn't exist, but it doesn't matter. Um, I was there. I had a good time. I loved it. It was a great occasion. And again, I recommend you. I recommend if you're a DJ fan or you like electronic music and you on the fence about seeing some of these guys play live, I really highly recommend you go and do it because there is something really amazing about seeing these dudes and these girls laying it down in a room um, for four plus hours and really bring it. It really makes you think like, okay, this is why these guys get paid the big bucks. Like, they are top, 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 top tier DJs. And there's no real mistake in that for the most part. But yeah, that was that, that was my kind of night out. Um, spent, um, what else did I do? That was it, isn't it, for the most part. Yeah, and then on still, and then I came back, and then that's that's basically been my weekend for the most part. Um, a lot, a lot of going out. Probably a lot, probably a bit more going out than I need than needs be. But you know, um, by and large, more going out than probably staying in. But um, one thing that I, uh, but I think what's going to make it better and it's going to fix things now for the most part is that I'm going to be back um, DJing this weekend. Or for the most part, no, not not this weekend. Uh, yeah, this weekend actually, from Saturday, I'm playing at the Heathcote and Star. Um, that's gonna be this Saturday coming up for my night called Labertees, which I've got. Should have had a flyer here on the screen, right? Can you see that? I'm put up here. So there you go. There's a flyer up on the screen here on Facebook, as you can see. So yes, yeah, so I'm playing this Saturday at the Heathcote and Star. So that's Saturday, April sixth, nine nine eight p.m. to one a.m. And again, I think this structure helps me a lot with the kind of discipline and hard work that I'm doing. Or the discipline and hard work that I'm trying to instill in myself consistently. I think I'm um, having uh, the weekend and completely de 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 devoted to DJing kind of really kind of slows me down a notch uh, because I'll be DJing every Friday now going forward too for the other night I do called uh, Tapped at Tap East, uh, which is happening the following Friday. I'm going to be there. Uh, let me find where I can find that flyer. It should be here somewhere. Let me get this off the screen. But yeah, um, I think going back to my DJing um, stuff now. Now this month or for the next year for the next couple of months coming up now it's going to really help me out i think going forward um i think i'll be able to kind of really uh discipline myself and really make sure that i'm putting in enough time um in order to kind of do the things that i need to do but yeah so tapped is coming up well they're, they're doing tap this friday i won't be there because i'll be seeing drake at the o2 which is something i'll mention later but um tap this friday is happening too so there's the event as you can see there on the screen for you youtube people uh so it's taps happening this friday april 5th at, at the at westford in tap east westford stratford so if you're in the area and you want to go see some of my friends play i recommend you check it out there it is there um and then i'm gonna be there from the following friday which is april 12th so you'll be able to see me there april 12th so if you're in around the area and you want to see me play some tunes come to tap east in westfield and i shall be there um that's it there here where is it there you go on the tap april 12th is happening as well so you'll be able to see us or oh, me playing there from that moment on um but yeah, um, I think that's really going to help me going forward. I really do need that structure. I think working out five days a week or six days a week has really helped me. And then also having that day to DJ, which then means I can't fuck up my weekends during the week because I have to prepare my music and mix and stuff and practice. And then when it comes to Friday, I'm having to play. Then I may be a bit tired or a bit hungover on a Saturday. That means I have to work. That means I don't have to, I'm not wasting as much time because I'm not, I won't be, probably go out on Saturday. It kind of has a real good domino effect in kind of making sure my whole life is kind of regimented and held together the right way and that's probably what i'm trying to do now um yeah so by and large that's basically the situation i've been on now and i'm kind of really looking forward to doing that coming up um what is next on the list here let's move on and get cracking here i want to do an hour and i'm going to nip off uh what can we talk about here now uh Da, 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 Tinker Hatfield reveals new clothing. Should we talk a little bit about this? What's this? Leave what, mate? Let's see it's on the screen. Uh, da, 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 da. 
Oh, you seen? Okay, cool. Let's let's speak about this a little bit, and then we'll, we'll move on. So this news here um, on from the BBC. Um, regarding this, he- this headline is pretty funny. Uh, the headline reads as following: I paid 160 pounds for a pair of limited edition nappies, which is you know I I didn't know this was a thing. I really didn't. The idea that there's limited edition nappies is just laughable, right? Considering that nappies are going to be full of shit, right? But hey, this article from the BBC. So it reads as following. Uh, think washable nappies and most of us will envision, envision a burdensome time consuming not to mention smelly commitment to reverse reserved only for the most the dedicated eco warrior but for many a convert clothed nappies are a, ho- are a hobby a passion and even an obsession cloth bumming as it's called in inside circles is no longer just about environment or saving money but also about fashion and the clamor to get most sought after designs on your baby's bottom it's like what so there's mums out there that would much rather buy uh, washable nappies because they want to be eco-friendly because I'm assuming uh, disposable nappies are similar to plastic bags, right? In that they're not very biodegradable and that they're probably filling up some landfill somewhere, probably being dug underground. Uh, they're probably contaminating a local area. They're probably causing kids to have asthma and shit. I'm sure they're not the most healthiest thing in the world, but I can't imagine anything worse than washing a nappy full of shit, especially baby shit. Baby shit, because they're usually... Whatever babies eat usually makes their shit runny as fuck, right? It's never... I don't know. I've never seen a baby that has shit that's like, you know, human shit or like regular adult shit. It's always fucking liquidy. So imagine having to wash that. It's just like... Have you ever... I think the first time I shit my pants, right, as an adult, there is a part of you that's like, oh, I'm going to wash these, right? Because you don't want to throw away your trousers, right? Because usually, you know, it happens to regular trousers that you wear. You don't want to throw them away. You know, you spend money on your trousers. And then you look at them and you're like, fuck that. I'm, 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 I'm burning these things, right? Because there's no amount of washing it feels like that's ever going to, you that's ever going to make you feel comfortable enough to wear them again. You're always going to feel a bit shitty. And that's the kind of feeling I have when I kind of, when I've kind of always been wearing um those kind of things by and large. Why is the, why is the, that's weird, isn't it? The camera light is on for some reason. I'm not too sure why here. Display capture. What's this happening here? Huh. Oh, I don't know why, but um, yeah, I've never felt too comfortable. Um, I've never felt the most. I've never felt super comfortable wearing trousers that have been sh- shattered. So I've, pr- I've always thrown them away, right? You've never, you've had that split idea, like oh, I'm gonna wash these, but then when you look at them, you see the damage that's caused, especially when you shit yourself in jeans or something, and it's like the shit has been smeared into every single thread that exists on that pair of jeans. It's like this no waste is gonna come out. Obviously it could come out because if mud and all that stuff can come out, then shit can, but there's something about shit that just makes you feel gross, right? And especially human shit. But again, you know, mum's the best. Um, some fans co- collect nappies in the same way others collect handbags. Limited edition, imagine, like handbags. It's like Drake, right? Drake supposedly buys Birkin bags as, um, lim- as kind of pieces that he buys to collect. Uh, some people say it's a way of him kind of, you know, to kind of get the ladies. Uh, but for the most part, he buys them for himself, right? As a kind of investment. Imagine if there was a rapper out there and just bought limited edition nappies. He just went into his crib. So, oh, this is my crib. This is where the, this is my room. This is where the magic happens. And this is my walking wardrobe. It just opens his wardrobe. It's just instead of being full of Jordans, just full of fucking nappies. He people will be looking at you like a weirdo. You'll be like, is this guy a pedo? Like, what's going on? People people will be worried about you a lot. Even if even if the nappies were like you know quietly. Um, uh, what you call it would have a lot of value to him. People wouldn't really want to. People wouldn't really want to associate themselves with you too much. Um, social media com- communities are flourishing and even have their own lexicon. So, what is it about these club nappies that draw such a clout following? Like, and again, here's a lady and her mum doing it. It's like there's some women that just enjoy being mums in it, just love having babies. I get really. I wonder what must happen to them psychologically when their babies grow up and they become, you know, kids and teenagers who don't want to have anything to do with their parents, like most teenagers are. It must be really soul crushing, isn't it? They devote like a huge chunk of their lives just being mothers. Their whole identity is being a mum. But I guess that's the kind of woman that's always perpetually pregnant. That's always kind of, you know, popping kids out. But I guess that must be really fucked up and it must really fuck up with your, it must really mess with your brain when your kids grow up and they don't want nothing to do with you. Leave me alone, mom. No, that kind of shit. Um, anyway, mother of four, Cecilia Leslie has built up a stash of about 500 nappies that she keeps so keep, that's the thing they're, they're rewashing why do you so many if you're going to rewash them full time midwife is now the full time midwife is now a cloth nappy influencer with more than she's an, you can be an influencer with nappies this is this is what we live in the greatest times ever don't we really 
We live in one of the most creative times ever. If you're if you're a fucking jam enthusiast, if you love fucking a particular kind of filter coffee, if you like honey and some, you can effectively carve out a little zone for yourself on the internet. The full time midwife is now a clothes nappy influencer. Like the vast majority of the real nappy users, the thirty two year old mum from Edinburgh originally uh, set out on her cloth journey to reduce plastic waste and save money. But over the years, it became a hobby. Um, I fully intended. Oh wow! Look at these nappies. They look amazing, isn't it? To be honest, though, they look pretty cool. That's that's a imagine a baby living. Is that a cot in the top? That's probably where they get changed. Wow, it's really cool, man. She went ham. Baby, so lucky. Um, da, 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 uh, I fully intended to use my cloth, um, you, the, my use of cloth to be, I guess I said the use of cloth, to be solely functional. But once I started, it became more of a case of wanting all the pretty patterns. I joined quite a few communities online where there are a lot of hype about having the prints. Um, so the prints are amazing, but I, I wonder what kind of cloth they use, a particular kind of cloth that washes better, right, or something it must exist, right? I've got a, limited, a lot of limited editions which sell out quickly. It became a, a big game of trying to track them down. I used to source them from Canada, Australia, and USA. Wow. I paid 80, 60 quid for a limited edition print that Tots Bots brought out when Prince George was born. And I want, wow, they make a limited edition Prince George. That's amazing, dude. That is so cool, no? Um, I once paid 160 for a pair of limited edition um, bum genius nappies. They were only 100 made. It's like, oh my God, this is the antithesis of hype culture. Some brands will launch a collection of a couple times a year with about five or six prints each time and I would buy all five in one go. I've also been known to buy five of the same print if it's one I particularly love. Is she addicted to cloth nappies? I think I am. I feel a sense of pride about how nice it looks and the conversation starter, especially at, at baby groups, especially I imagine some mums be like, oh my God, they look amazing. Imagine a mum that just buys regular nappies from fucking Sainsbury's. You must feel like, you must feel poor. And that's the thing. Nappies used to be a, a sign of like, you know, wealth because they're expensive, right? Nappies are super expensive. Now there's a, another level up with these cloth nappies and now another level up from that, cloth nappies that are limited edition. It's like, wow. Miss Leslie says she chatted up to her husband about how she feels, about how he feels about her nappy habit. He agreed the money could be better spent, but he said that there are a lot of worse things I could be addicted to. You know, which is neither here nor there. That's, that's generally what a husband would say, right? Look, leave me out of this, you crazy woman. <laughs> but as long as our child's bum is clean, I'm cool. I mean, and doesn't and doesn't owning so many nappies defeat the object of reusable product? Um, I do get some negative comments about the size of my collection. Yes, it's more than I need, but those nappies were bought at independent shops, so it's keeping people in jobs. Eh, come on now. I use every single nappy I own. None of them just sit in the shelf. It's not producing landfill. Once Isaac grows out of them, I'll sell them on and give them to them. Um, you can sell on nappies at... Okay. Um, I guess I'm guessing... I'm guessing with these reusable nappies that the bit inside that gathers the shit you can throw away and then you wash the actual nappy nappy. I'm sure. Because if it's just the whole thing, that's a bit gross, isn't it? Why would you buy that? It's like buying people's user. I guess some girls do buy used bikinis, which I don't get. But anyway, um, so, so basically, so overall, it's a positive thing. It's not just a frivolous hobby. Um, look at this baby. Look how lucky this little girl is. Look at you, eh? Lucky motherfucker. Um, Nicola Vanderbroek, a mambo 17 month year old, drew. Oh, it's a boy, sorry, Drew. My apologies, Drew. She become passionate about colorful cloth nappies. I only started cloth bumming. Cloth bumming is a really weird term for pretty colors. I discovered a print called Kaleidoscope, and I just thought, wow, this is amazing. I bought in a couple of others just because they looked cool. Off the back that I started to get into some of the Facebook groups and it all took off from there. Yeah, mums. Oh, there's so many mums on Facebook. It's just insane, isn't it? I have about 40 and every couple of weeks when the doorbell rings of a delivery, my husband complains, not another nappy order. <laughs> like I said, these mums, when their kids grow up, they must be so pissed, isn't it? Like, what do you do now when your kids grow up? When your kids are adults and teenagers, it's just like, ugh. I feel sorry for them but anyway in some ways but i think this is awesome because it gives them passion something to do you know mums can be bored at home not doing anything so if they've got a little interest that they like with these nappies and who am i to complain about that zoe davis who runs a nappy library at st alston cornwall says using the real nappies helped her cope with postmodern depression following the birth of her son see I told, this is what i said before i even read that bit i'm sure it kind of helps them it's cool man like they've got an interest right 
um, you connect with other mums all around the world and stuff. I think it's really cool. It's something to look forward to with new prints coming out. They're all happy colours. When you see them hanging out on the line, it's a pleasure to see. Exactly, I imagine that too when they're all drying out. It's a really wholesome thing. The online coffee nappy community is so supportive. The routine, the ritual helped me too. It helped me think that even though I'm suffering with depression, there's something I can achieve and something good for. That's awesome. Fucking awesome. I knew it. There's something wholesome coming from it. Uh, Fiona Smith, director of cloth nappy manufacturer, Totspot says she has stunned by reaction limit edition prints named Royal Flush released on the celebration of Prince George. Is that the Royal Flush? Wow. It's really cool though, to be honest. That print's really nice. Um, we, made it, we made 500 Royal Nappies and they sold out within an hour and a half. The website crashed. The retailer site crashed. We charged a normal price of £18 for them, but they started reappearing £18 only. That's awesome. For 150 within a week. We only made 30 of the uh, teeny fits which fit babies up to 12 pounds and they were selling okay is that how they do it they they measure them in pounds and still selling on ebay 50 60 quid this is a five-year-old nappy which costs 12 pound new wow parents can be quite fanatical when it comes to this range and they start stalking the website they want to be the first in line it adds a little bit of joy to something that's not usually that much fun yeah the clean nappy is not the best thing in the world but you know uh Carly Bale, this lady here, head of products at Northampton, Bambino Mio. That's, that's, that's quite a good good name. I like that. Manager the brand consult, brand is on iPod. People really care about their children and what they're wearing. I like to make a statement. We currently launch one collection of our designs a year, but the appetite for fun and designs is getting stronger and stronger. But yeah, okay, man. Fair play, man. Fair play. I don't mind this actually. These babies look cute in their little nappies, and I guess if mums have an opportunity to have something interesting that's going to make them not be so depressed or bummed out because they're at home looking after their kids, not out living their life, because that does happen for some mums, and it's cool, and also just a good interest to have. Man, you you make. I'm assuming it can be hard to make mum friends, right? Um, especially when you don't have an interest that you might share, except for having a kid. It might come be a bit weird and awkward, but when you have this little interest in design and buying limited edition stuff, then, you know, you probably will meet other mums within these friendship groups or Facebook groups and you, be, you might meet up in real life, blah, 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 blah. So by and large, it's a good thing and I'm happy for the mums. Anyway, that's an hour of the Excellence English Show episode number 172. Again, sorry for the summer note at the start, but as you know it's just nipsey was a big a big inspiration of mine and somebody i looked up to i'm a big fan listen to every single one of his mixtapes and album and i'm a huge fan i'll be kind of banging out his music the whole week uh um and i'm just gonna you know i'm just gonna try my best to whatever influence and inspiration that he gave me i'm gonna try my best to bring that forward and inspire others to kind of follow suit and just be good people and try to do well by a community, even when they don't want us to do well for them. Um, that being said, this is episode number 172 of the External Zinger Show. R.I.P. Nipsey Hustle for life. Um, you'll be sorely missed, but you're never going to be forgotten. Um, for information regarding myself, website design, all that sort of malarkey, go on website, zinger.com. It will be on there. I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. And we'll talk again soon. Peace.